So Ben, welcome to the MedicCast. I uh, got to meet you in Las Vegas, but this is uh, the first opportunity to actually have you on the show officially. Yeah, I mean, it's great we can finally talk. It was uh, excellent meeting you in Vegas uh, at one of those uh, brilliant uh, functions that they have there. And I uh, met uh, pretty much the, the top um, EMS uh, bloggers and podcasters, of which I think uh, you were the, you know, creme de la creme. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I know you got a chance to sit down and talk to Chris Montera, and that was just a fabulous interview, um, and, and, you know, really just to chat with him and see uh, what you're doing. But I don't know if a lot of folks know about what your, what your uh, background is, and uh, so why don't we start off by just asking you to tell everybody a little bit about Ben Gilmore, the paramedic, uh, your background and, and where you work and live and stuff. Well, I started off uh, working here in, in Australia when I was uh, 19, uh, and joined the ambulance service down out of Sydney. Um, I always kind of wanted to be wanted to be a paramedic, and so soon after um, joining, I was uh, posted out to to a very remote area in our state. Uh, and there are some extremely remote areas in Australia that uh, need to be covered by ambulance services. So I was sent out there, and the book that uh, we're speaking about actually begins. With my adventures out in in the in the bush, in the outback, uh, you could say, and I've worked as a paramedic ever since. I'm now, of course, back in the city. I've been back in the city a long time. I've just come off a night shift, actually, in in town. Um, a very hectic Halloween night shift, mm-hmm. <laughs> as you can only uh, imagine. Uh, and so and so, you know, I, I still love it. I still enjoy it. And despite my filmmaking and my writing. Um, I, I'm really ha- most happy when I'm when I'm in an ambulance. Well, and and it shows. I mean, just reading your book and and uh, you know, especially you know some of the introductory segments, you, you get captured by the book right away. I have to say, just not only because I think it easily quickly identifiable as a story about an EMS professional. But uh, just the fun things that happen to you. We all have quirky, odd things that we, we deal with in our lives as paramedics. But I have to say your exploits uh, are top the list, I think, for some of the things that I've ever seen and heard about. So, uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I always think that, that uh, you know, the vast majority of paramedics have experienced uh, a lot more craziness than I have. I mean, I started off in 1996, and certainly when I'm speaking to my paramedic elders, uh, about their their work during during the seventies um, and even even as early as the sixties, uh, there are still there are still medics out there working who began in the mid to late sixties, and uh, their stories are, are incredible. You know, having ambulances um, with you know five or six casualties on board, uh, very little equipment, um, being diverted uh, with critical patients on board, being diverted to other other major accidents, uh, you know, it's 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 mind mind blowing, and so I mean, I'm I'm always in awe of, of of their their work during those those difficult times when they didn't have the resources, the equipment, uh, and you know, the work practices, and um, and certainly the safety and and uh, that that we have now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that um, really it's very difficult for the public to to fully grasp what we experience as paramedics. Um, Quite bizarre. I mean, last night we were we were driving across a an overpass, and and there was uh, there was a a man wearing very uh, very little. Um, I, well, he was wearing a, a pink bow tie and bun ears, <laughs> and that was about it. And he was standing on the edge of the overpass, um, about to jump off. And we managed oh to grab him in time. I mean, you know, what what other what other kind of what other workers what other uh, People on this planet would find themselves in a situation where they're they're grappling uh, with uh, a naked person on the edge of an overpass with an 18 meter drop on the other side, uh, uh, a patient wearing nothing more than than a, than a pink bow tie and bunny ears. I mean, it's bizarre, you know. And so these these are the kind of experiences that happen uh, every day to to paramedics um, around the world. You know, I mean, they they vary a little bit depending on the culture that you you know you happen to be working in. But uh, they're certainly entertaining, fascinating uh, stories, uh, uh, as well as obviously sometimes being very moving. And what I like you, that you did was took your experiences, not just your own personal experiences in the workplace, but also um, your traveling experiences where you went to other parts of the world and, 
and, and, and saw what other paramedics and, and EMS professionals were doing in different areas. And something I've always found just from doing my show and, and, and interacting with people from different parts of the world, uh, taking care of patients, that, that health care, that healing touch, you know, it really is very similar no matter where you go. Did you find that to be true in, in your travels as well? Absolutely, without a doubt. And that's one of the most, uh, uh, you know, impressive things. And, and what struck me um, wherever I went was that this dedication, this commitment, because I think people who aren't in the job for the right reasons uh, don't last very long in this type of industry. I mean, they just they they end up leaving. I mean, it is it requires um, a certain you know passion and more than just turning up to to work to you know earn, earn a wage. I mean, I think that uh, uh, no matter what uh, training, what level of training, I mean, even even medics who were simply ambulance drivers and certainly there are many places in the world where that is still the case uh, where they didn't have much first aid training. I mean there are parts of Pakistan in the south where a lot of the, or across Pakistan actually, there are still uh, places as an example where where ambulance drivers do very, um, not, not very much more than that, you know, and yet that commitment uh, was still there and, and in fact you know these uh, these medics. I mean, these drivers. I guess have to do what many of us will never uh, probably have to do, and I'm grateful for that. I mean, they have to put um, put multiple patients in the back of their ambulance after bomb blasts, and and they see horrific things, and they have to deal with extreme environments where you know the public take charge of their ambulance the moment it arrives on scene. I mean, that's one of the scariest things is that your ambulance is essentially public property the moment it arrives on scene and the, the, the doors are all wrenched open, the back doors wrenched open and, and suddenly without even getting uh, out from behind the wheel of your ambulance it's, you know, it's full of you know, bodies, living, dead, body parts, everything uh, you know, um, piled high and then you know, someone's uh, you know, banging the side of the ambulance uh, you know, um, egging you on to, to, to floor it to the hospital. So these are some of the things that these ambulance drivers have to face. And certainly, I mean, uh, if they didn't have that, that level of passion and commitment, um, they, they wouldn't be doing that. So what drew you to, to write the book? I mean, what, what was the, the impetus for this uh, uh, journey uh, as an author and, and writing the book Paramedico and then, and then creating the film that, that is really the companion, I think, to the book in some ways. Well, I think it becomes very apparent to, to people who join an ambulance service anywhere in the world, um, it becomes very you know, quickly apparent that um, the job is so interesting. I mean, as a paramedic, you are allowed into the lives of, of a diverse range of people at uh, the most critical point, usually, I mean, not always, but, but often, uh, of those, those people's lives, the crisis moment, even if it's just uh, a crisis moment in that patient's imagination, uh, which it sometimes is. But, but in any case, I mean, this is a, this is a crisis moment. It's a, often a moment of drama. It's a moment of, uh, you know, sometimes a moment of extreme stress, uh, extreme excitement, extreme hilarity even uh, and bizarreness and so we get to be witnesses to that moment and I think that um, immediately that is uh, fascinating to all people um, and, and of course often very entertaining. People open newspapers to read often about the dramas that have gone on overnight or the day before mm -hmm. you know and, and, you know, I don't know whether you can call it a morbid curiosity, but I think humans have a certain uh, fascination with um, their own mortality and, you know, um, whether it's a fear or a, I think it's part fear and part fascination. And so, you know, we're, we're drawn to that. And, and so as, as medics, we, 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 we see that. We're there. We actually bear witness to that. We're not just reading about it. We can actually tell you those stories. So this book, Paramedico, was not meant to be and just a book for other medics, although you know it seems to have become quite popular amongst uh, paramedics around the world, um, where it's been published in the language 
I mean, mainly it's been published in English at the moment. There are working on some translations. But it's also, uh, you know, become, uh, it's also generated a lot of interest among ordinary readers who are fascinated with getting an insight into the world of the paramedic. And the film is interesting, I think, because you really have divided it up into uh, four locations, um, if I think correctly, or maybe three, no, four. Um, Pakistan, um, Venice, Mexico, and Hawaii. That's right. Which I, I think quite an interesting selection. What, what brought those four locations to the front of the pack uh, that you said, these are the ones I want to represent in the film? Well, the, the, the book uh, takes the reader to uh, 13 different nations in which I've either worked or, or ridden along on ambulances or volunteered or even done a little bit of ambulance service development in places like Pakistan. But uh, uh, so, so that started off uh, in my early 20s when I started using my annual leave and they're very generous down here with their annual leave. They give you six weeks a year and you can usually do a few swaps and, and uh, you know, kind of stretch that out to a couple of months. So I've taken that opportunity every year for the last decade and a half of traveling overseas and working uh, or volunteering um, on ambulances. And, uh, but in the last four years, I wanted to make a documentary as well as a, as a accompanying piece to the book. And so I took a camera with me, and thus the last four, I mean, the last four destinations where I spent any considerable time, I, I took the camera. So it happened to be uh, Mexico, Hawaii, um, Venice, uh, Italy, uh, and Pakistan. And I think, they're a, you know, I think they're a good mix because, I mean, they are, they're, they're, they're very, very different from each other. I mean, when you see the film, what I wanted to do was cut between the four different locations um, in order to show, without being too overt about it, the, the, the differences in the environments in which they work, but the commonality in the dedication and passion um, of those medics. I was fascinated by the Mexican segment. Uh, they were like constantly running out of gas, well, it yeah. seemed like. It's, it's a shame that that happens to stand out for people. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've had a few a few uh, Mexican EMS um, professionals uh, taking the task on that. Um, oh, really? I'm sorry. I didn't mean just, to bring it up, it, but no, it stood out to me. I mean, it, it just, you know. A lot of people mentioned that. And one thing was that I, I happened to catch this on film while I was there, that it wasn't, it didn't just happen once. It happened numerous times in this particular ambulance that on the way to emergencies and away from emergencies, they ran out of petrol, ran out of gas. And, uh, and I happened to catch it on film and the, the Mexican paramedics I was working with, they said, please do us a favor and use this material because we want people to realize the conditions we're working under here. Their petrol gauge, to, to, to uh, clarify, their petrol gauge wasn't working. And so they could never judge exactly how much they had in the tank. And, uh, and this was a great problem. And they couldn't get this gauge fixed because they didn't have any money in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the fund to, to fix it. They didn't have enough money to pay for more than a few pairs of gloves per shift. So one of the golden rules that they told me was don't use your gloves too early in the shift. And when you're dealing with, as you know, in Mexico, they have the narco war and they have a lot of violence and criminality in certain areas. You're dealing with a, a higher rate of trauma. You might be going to half a dozen shootings in a night with only three pairs of examination gloves. Um, you know, it was it was good advice, but but it was very frustrating. I mean, they had to ventilate people with no oxygen, and you know, because they'd run out for that week. And this is just, I just want to make clear, this is just one particular um, one particular uh, part of the or, or 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 station of the of the Red Cross in an outlying area of Mexico City. There are parts of Mexico uh, where the EMS is actually quite good. And the response times are, are, are excellent and, you know, on par with uh, many, um, you know, Western nations. But uh, this particular, you know, it, it really does vary across, across Mexico. So I, I wouldn't like people to assume that all Mexican ambulances are running out of gas all the time.
or have. But certainly, but certainly, this particular one was dealing with budgetary issues, and I think it, it's something that's important to point out because I know here in the states there are many rural EMS services that are either closing their doors or cutting back on service hours or things like that because they can't put diesel in their ambulance. They can't, you know, they can't find the budget or find the staffing to uh, get the unit out on a regular basis. Um, and, and so these are problems everybody's facing. It's not limited to, you know, different countries. It's, it's, a, it's a problem here as well and, and, and maybe a problem in Australia. I don't know, but we certainly are facing it. I, I think there is there are similar problems in some places in Australia. I mean, we're very fortunate in Australia with our health system that we have in place, and I think slowly the U.S. is moving in a similar direction in recent times. Um, I'm hoping because uh, we have uh, an allocated we have government funding uh, for EMS that because EMS is considered an essential service the government needs to provide. So therefore, wherever you happen to be. And we have a very large, uh, you know, area within our borders, like uh, as the states does too. But I mean, we have a lot of area to cover. But wherever you happen to be, even if that is a small country town in the middle of nowhere, uh, our government, um, you know, has an obligation to provide emergency services to you. You might not get an ambulance in seven minutes, but uh, you will get an ambulance dispatched to you. So. You know, there's there's different ways of doing that. You know, community um, community paramedics, etc. But uh, that is the funding for that is is largely taken care of uh, down here, which which we which you know I'm very grateful for because I'm not ever worried about uh, you know whether I can put diesel in the in the sprinter. <laughs> What's the country that stood out to you the most, and in, in of the countries you visited, the ones in the book? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I was struck by Venice. You know, I was really intrigued by that water ambulance that was going up and down the canals, and sometimes they couldn't fit underneath some of the footbridges, and and uh, how were they going to get the patient into the boat? Uh, kind of questions. But were there other places in the book that that you stood out to you as as interesting experiences or something unique that you'd like to share with the audience? Sure. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned Venice and there were definitely unique challenges in Venice. I mean, it's an ancient city and, uh, and really the ancient system is the only one that seems to work there. I mean, I'll give you an example. The Venetian ambulance boats trialed um, GPS locators, they tried uh, GPS navigators uh, for a while and, and they, they failed dismally because the navigator wasn't able to uh, assess. And I guess they could probably build this in if they, if they, you know, if there's enough funding for it. But the navigator couldn't ass assess uh, the, you know, level of the water level, so the tide, the tides, which dictate whether an ambulance can actually get to a certain part of the city, because if the water is too low, um, the the boat will run aground. If it's too high, it won't. The boat won't be able to fit under the bridges. So it excludes at any time of the day. It can exclude large parts of the city. Um, and of course, you, you, your GPS isn't going to work that out. Um, and also, the smaller canals, um, it doesn't figure out your flooding, it doesn't figure out all these kind of um, logistical issues. And interestingly, the, the carry chair that these, uh, the rescue carry chair that these, these medics use in Venice is still the same design um, that was used in Napoleonic times. Uh, and you know uh, when Napoleon was in, in the city, and 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 I thought that was very interesting, and and it's purely because they've, they've, they've tried uh, trialed other ones, they've tried all these you know great you know new um, uh, you know carry chairs, but they still opt for this old wooden chair with large wheels, very wide chair um, based on the original design because it just simply works the best. Now that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, but there are but there's certainly other places in the book that I thought. Um, offer their own individual challenges. I mean, from a dispatch perspective, uh, the Philippines, at least when I was in the Philippines, is going back more than a decade. Uh, there wasn't an EMS um, dispatch system set up. Uh, I think only now, even now it's only its infancy. But back then, to, to find out where your emergency was, the medics had to listen to the news bulletins on the radio every half an hour. And and get updates on on where the you know where the accident was happening, where the you know where the train crash was happening, and you know and then then dispatch themselves based on listening to the you know the half hour news bulletin, which was quite bizarre. 
But I mean, the, the, book is, the book is the book is full of those kind of. I tried to draw out those quirky uh, things that are, that are that are unique aspects of those ambulance services that I'm so fascinated by. So you know, as we wrap up here, um, tell us a, a thought you'd like to share after your travels with uh, uh, you know the, the aspiring paramedic that I, mean, I have a lot of students that check out the show that are in training and, and going through school. Uh, what, what kind of advice would you give them based upon your travels as a, uh, as a paramedic talking to a future paramedic? Well, you know, it sounds very simple, uh, but um, I, I mean, I hear a lot of paramedics complaining about the conditions, their work conditions. Um, and I can understand that, you know, I mean, certainly when I was over in the States, um, I heard a lot of uh, people make comments about... Um, you know, the, the poor pay and the poor conditions. And certainly compared with Australia, uh, you guys don't seem to have it as good as, good as we do. I mean, it's, and, I, and I really hope that uh, in America that that does change, that, you know, the professional status uh, becomes more widespread, that you get, you, get, uh, you know, paid uh, what you're worth in terms of what, what you do for, for a job, um, which I certainly think isn't the case at the moment. Uh, but regardless of all those difficulties that we face in the West as paramedics, uh, what a lot of medics are doing in places like India and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq, where they can be working for an entire month without a single day off, uh, in some cases, um, you know, six months at a time, without any rest, 24-7, uh, you know, and with very limited equipment, on, on, you know, sometimes less than $3 a day uh, in terms of their, their remuneration, uh, without gloves, you know, without basic um, personal protection, uh, picking up, you know, you know, the, the, the after, you know dealing with the aftermath of, of, of large, you know, truck bombs where you have, where you have dozens, dozens of, of, of people um, traumatically killed and, and, and injured. Uh, you know, it really puts into perspective the things that I had been uh, complaining about or, or had been getting down about uh, in my service over the years and has made me a lot more grateful for the conditions I work under and, and for what, you know, the, the lifestyle I have as a paramedic. I guess that's what I would say to junior paramedics is that, you know, if you think it's bad, it can always be a lot worse. Good advice, I think. Really good advice for uh, the, the students out there and for the people that are working. Uh, and, uh, it, it, we have to really keep perspective on uh, what other people are dealing with in different parts of the world. Um, ben, thanks a lot. Um, paramedico.com.au so they can find uh, links to uh, the book and the movie. Uh, I highly recommend both. Uh, and the book's available in an audiobook as well as uh, a paperback version. Uh, so I just... I can't say enough about it. There'll be links in the show notes so you can go right to Amazon and pick it up uh, or, and also links to Ben's site. And, and Ben, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet again. Maybe I can wangle a trip to uh, come down to an EMS conference in Australia sometime. You're welcome. Let's do it. I'll see you down here for a beer. <laughs>